Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Now, if you're listening to this live, then it is the day before Thanksgiving in the United States. So if you celebrate it, I hope you're ready, you're getting ready at least to enjoy your friends and family, of course, some good food and some time off work. So for me, I'm the one who does the cooking in my family. And this year I decided I am not cooking a turkey. No turkey for me. I make it, well, not too many years, but for the past few years and spend a lot of time on it. And at the end of the day, my kids don't care. No one's really, I don't really like turkey that much. And so I'm not going to make a big turkey because the leftovers will probably go bad. And more than likely before I put any food on the table, my two-year-old Haley will say, me no like that. And it'll make me feel bad. So a nice meal, making some chicken. (laughs) <laughs> How's that for, for being a rebel? Now, if you are in the Redesigning Wellness Facebook community, thank you for some of the ideas that you have had lately. So I put out a call, a post, I guess is the best way to say it, that I am really trying to plan for 2020 for guests on the podcast. And I want to get outside of my own perspective and hear what other people want to actually hear about. And wow, what an amazing outpouring of ideas. So if you are listening and you're in the Redesigning Wellness community, thank you so much. And if you're not, you should join us. But I'm telling you this because there's going to be some really good topics that have been hand-selected by amazing wellness professionals that will be guests in 2020. But on to today's topic. Now, there comes a time in the life of a wellness professional's career that I think we start pondering if we should go out on our own. Now with wellness, at least in my experience, um, often there's only so far that we can go within an organization, you know, kind of like up the ladder, if you will. And often to get promoted, we need to shift into a different role or a different department. So before I left my corporate job, they, you know, if I wanted to advance, if I wanted, because that's just me, it's my personality. I like to advance and I like to, I have goals. And so I could go to a different department and get the title and get more money, et cetera. But I was like, eh, I like wellness and that's what I want to do. So I decided to obviously go out on my own. And so here's how this topic came about of going out on your own as a wellness professional. So today's guest, Maggie Goff, her and I both got to keynote at Wellcoa this past year. And so we were just chatting about our businesses, we're friends. And so She just said, you know what, we should get on the podcast and talk about this, what it's like to be out on our own. Because I know she gets questions, I get questions. And so we just thought we'd have a nice, candid conversation. And I interviewed Maggie not too long ago. So episode 130, which I'll link up in the show notes. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Maggie. She has been a part of the corporate wellness industry for over a decade. And she has been a true student of her experiences, a renegade, always challenging how things can be made better. This has launched her into a position of leadership on a local and national level. If you want the truth, a real authentic conversation around corporate health, she is the person to talk to. And this is not in our bio, but I will attest that she is just a wonderful human being. Now, Maggie introduced me to a new term. We don't talk about it here. She told me this term, I think when we were at Wilcoa or some point, who knows, a vulnerability hangover. Now, I am pretty much uh, the same. Like, so I'm sitting here recording this. Like if I had a conversation with you, I would be the same kind of person. If I'm on stage speaking, I I mean, I don't have like this stage front and then this other kind of personality. I'm just the same. And although I I like to say I'm pretty candid about most things, I was extremely candid in this, this podcast. And that's why I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable about releasing it because, you know, I'm having that vulnerability hangover. But that's okay. I think I need to put it out there because so many people have this fantasy of what owning their own business is like. And although I have zero regrets and I am very happy being on my own, it's also hard. And there are challenges, but I'm afraid I was too real about the hardships. So I want you to know that even with the challenges that entrepreneurship brings, it's 100% worth it, at least for me. And I know Maggie feels the same. So I wanted to give the challenges because, you know, not everyone's cut out for it. And that is completely okay. So even when I look back at my jobs, I was always self-directed. No one ever needed to tell me to do my job. If they did, it kind of irritated me. I've always been 
enjoying freedom and autonomy. And some people like to be given, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's the structure. And not only that, you're not told what to do. You create this thing out of nothing. You know, that's what business is, right? You're creating something and then you have to market it and then you have to sell it and then you have to make sure you pay your bills, all of those things. So I want to give you the real deal. And that's what I did in this podcast. And just let you know that if entrepreneurship or owning your own business is not for you, that is okay. Because there's nothing wrong with being gainfully employed and get regular paychecks and get 401k and get PTO and all that stuff. So yes, vulnerability hangover is, is, is real and it's happening to me. So if you, if you listen to this and you have any comments, shoot me an email, put a contact form. I'd love to hear what you think. Now, before we dive in, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Workplace Money Coach. Workplace Money Coach is offering a special train the trainer promotion for 2020 for their Living Paycheck to Purpose program. The Living Paycheck to Purpose program is comprised of four live workshops that take employees through a series of activities and thought provoking discussions designed to help build positive money management behaviors. Workplace Money Coach can train one of your employees to facilitate that program, the Living Paycheck to Purpose, so your company can save thousands of dollars while experiencing their life-changing financial well-being program at work. Let me tell you some details. For the cost of one four-week program, it is $1,935, and your company can send up to two employees through this facilitator training program, and Workplace Money Coach will waive all the workbook and admin fees for your company for the entire year. That's a big deal. Now, this means your company can deliver the four-week living paycheck to purpose program to your team as many times as you want throughout the year at no additional cost beyond the initial 1935 investment. So let me tell you a little bit about my personal experience with Workplace Money Coach. I hired Workplace Money Coach to bring in a living paycheck to purpose facilitator into my clients earlier this year. And I was really, really happy with the program and the experience. So people enjoyed the program. I love how in the very first session you're connecting your financial success. First of all, you're defining your financial success. What does that mean to you? What does money mean to you? And what can it give you? Kind of what are your goals with it? And that's where you start. And then you go into some, some other items, but if you don't connect it to what matters, then it's just more information, right? But the experience too, you know, although Shane, the founder, wasn't the one to facilitate the sessions, he was highly involved because he deeply cares about the success of your company and the employees that take the workshop. He wants you to be successful. He wants your employees to be successful. So highly involved. I really loved working with him personally. And if you want to learn more about Shane, I did interview him on my podcast, episode 121, which I'll link up in the show notes. And then finally about Shane, he's going to be coming into Redesigning Wellness Academy to discuss financial wellness in the workplace. And I knew he was right for to bring in as a guest speaker because when I interviewed him on my podcast, he gave me some fresh new ideas that had nothing to do with him and bringing him in as a vendor. So I just, I think the world of Shane and you know, really workplace money coach is changing lives by helping employees discover the power of their paychecks through better money management. Now you can head to workplacemoneycoach.com and schedule a time to speak with Shane about this train the trainer promotion in 2020. Make sure you know that you found out about it on the redesigning wellness podcast. And I, of course, will link up his website in the show notes. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this very real and very candid conversation with Maggie Goff. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, corporate wellness consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Maggie, welcome back to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you back on. Welcome. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. I love that we just came up with this idea. We're like, we should talk about this. Oh, I think it was your idea, and I think it was a great one. (laughs) It was like, hey, we should really talk about this. And I was like, yeah, I'm game. Let's do it. So I credit you with this idea. (laughs) Oh, thanks. Well, I think a good place for us to start is just 
why we decided to go out on our own. And of course, I want you to start with kind of what made you leave your job. And you told a little bit of the story on the last podcast with you, and I'll link that up in the show notes, but you tell the story on why you decided to go out on your own. Yeah, I was listening to a book a couple years before I went out on my own from the guy, and I can't remember his name, but it was the guy who the movie The Pursuit of Happiness was Mm -hmm. made about. And he was talking about, so it was his book that he had written, and he was talking about entrepreneurship and how sometimes you kind of take this leap of faith and you're like ready to go and you feel like it's the right time. And then sometimes the universe shoves you. And I remember thinking at the time, like, oh my God, that sounds horrible. What <laughs> <laughs> like the universe shoving you just, sounds horrible? Yeah. yeah <laughs> that's, that's how I would describe my experience. <laughs> I came to this point in my life where the work that I was doing wasn't really in line with the values that I have and the way in which I wanted to serve people. And I just really felt like I didn't, I didn't know how to make things better or where to go to do the kind of work I wanted to do. And an opportunity came for me to take a step back from career life and pause and think for a minute. And so I took it and then I was like, well, I don't have anywhere else to work right now and I need an income. So I guess I will start a business. So yeah, I, for me, it was like the universe shoved me and I just decided like, I've heard other women say, I, in a moment where I wasn't really sure who to trust, I knew I could trust myself. I'd put my money on me. And that was the choice that I made. Got it. So did you act, so you actively left the job, if I'm understanding. Like I you, did. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I knew that. I just wanted to clarify it for the, for the listeners. I love that quote. That's a really good one. And you know, when you were saying, that I read this book that made me think about like, I've never seen myself as, a, as an entrepreneur and business owner ever in a million years. And a few years before I started going out on my own, I started listening to podcasts all about like how people made money if they weren't in traditional jobs. And I hadn't thought about that in a long time, but you bringing up the book made me think of that because apparently that would got in my head over the course of a few years. And it is funny how for me too, it was like, I don't, there's nothing really that sounds good, right? There's nothing out there Mm -hmm. like in our field that's like, yeah, I'd love to go work there or I want to do this. It's like, yeah, I've done what I needed to do and work the places I think I wanted to work. And there wasn't a lot there for me either. So it's like, Mm -hmm. for me, I guess it was like, all right, I guess going out on my own seems like the most exciting thing right now uh, to go for. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Kind of a little, I mean, it's not sad. I mean, I'm glad we're both on our own. I'm just thinking about sometimes there is this lack of career growth in our field that Mm. it stops at a certain, you know, a certain point. And I think a lot of the people that come to me that say, hey, you know, kind of interested in going out on your own or their own, that they are kind of have reached the highest level, maybe that they can reach within their organization. And there's not a lot else for them. Yeah, that's interesting too. I'm going to leap off of that because in, I knew that I needed a new job. And so I had been applying other places and I started applying in the nonprofit world. And because I knew, I knew that I could do program management. I knew that I could develop programs, figure out all the details, put them in play and then measure their success right? Like that's what we do in wellness is program management, a lot of what we do. And so I had been applying for jobs in the nonprofit world that I thought would be more aligned with my values and the way in which I wanted to do work and solve problems in our world. And of course, without any nonprofit experience was struggling on that front. But I do think it is hard. I think career growth is hard in our industry. And I was talking to somebody recently who has done a phenomenal job and he's out looking and he has such rich experience and he had made the comment, wellness director isn't a common job title. And it's really not a common job title in the way that we would like to think of it, where it's mm-hmm. like a key part of the way that an organization is run compared to like, it's a wellness director and like, you're like constantly fighting for every little bit that you get Or in some cases where it's like, oh, you're the wellness director. We have this online platform and your job is to manage that. 
or very which is their whole other kind of more of a wellness right, coordinator, right? right. So you just put on activities and you do stuff and you coordinate, which is, I mean, that, that takes a skill set. I'm not saying that's not easy at all, but that's where they want to, a lot of organizations want to keep it, just coordinate some activities and you schedule the flu shot. And right. Like you said, the online activities, and that's what the job is. Right. And I think for some, for those of us who end up in these types of roles, like we're the, okay, like there's the, where's the next barrier to well-being and how are we going to solve for that and how are we going to support people and what things need to change and so there seems like always kind of this lens towards like what's the next thing and mm-hmm. so I do think that there comes a point where like maybe you've started in more of that coordinator role or program manager and then you as you come to go deeper and deeper into the things that are challenging for somebody to achieve well-being or move towards well-being you kind of hit this point where like it's the end of what the organization wants for you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think those jobs, I think that we'll see them become more available over the next decade or two. Not at all. Um, Otherwise we're like, we're going to lose some great professionals that are in there trying to make the changes and they get tired and exhausted of burnout. Yeah. I I hope so. It seemed like a couple years ago too, there was what I was calling like the the well-being professional exodus. I feel like every time I turned around, there was like a colleague that was like, yeah, I, I'm, I can't mm-hmm. keep doing it. And and then there were like a handful of us that were like, okay, like we'll, we'll create our own way mm-hmm. right. to stick with it. Right. Yeah. And I'm hoping that that trickle of people <laughs> is dying down. But a lot, I mean, some people are going out, going out on their own and they're still doing well being. It's just from the outside. And right. I think one area I'm interested in talking about is kind of where we started from day one into our business or day 30 or day 90 or whatever you want to say. And then where we are today, cause you've been in business longer than I have. You've been four years, I think out on your own. Right. Mm-hmm. So talk about yeah. like how, like how you started and then how it evolved over the four years. Oh man. So I, again, cause the universe kind of shoved me. I basically was, I had this smatter of, smattering of ideas. Maybe it sounded a lot like that podcast you listen to of people like piecemealing work together. I had a couple of different ideas of where I could use my expertise to make money. So I had one idea where I could have people, you know how there's like those parties where like you'll sell like pampered chef or mm-hmm. nail polish or makeup or whatever, right? Well, I was like, women like getting together for things like this. They don't have a lot of their social needs met, but like, and also a lot of women are curious about well-being and health. And as a dietitian, like what if we could get everybody together for a glass of wine, an evening of fun, and it would be like group coaching. So that was one idea I had. And then I had this other idea where I was like, well, there's my husband is a coach. And so I was fairly tapped into the athletic industry here regionally and like a lot of soccer clubs and different things like that. And I thought, I wonder if I could have teams come out and I could do presentations for kids around health and taking care of their bodies as athletes. I had done some of that work when I worked for a university, I had worked with their alongside their athletic teams to help them. So I had some experience in that. And then of course I had this like corporate wellness event because I had done work like that. So like my original website had all three of these things as like options, like, like an interesting array, <laughs> right. <laughs> which like naturally, right. Naturally the feedback and I'm sharing this story. I'm sharing this vulnerable story to the people out there because you learn that, that the goal is not that you start once you have it all figured out. The goal is you start no. and you learn. And so I'm sharing the story about like my insane concept of having these three very random things put together on a web page and just like letting it evolve. And of course, the feedback I got from business consultants was like, people don't know who you are. Like, what? we don't get this. What is it about? <laughs> I love it. And this is great. It's a great story. (laughs) Right. And so I did have, I did have a company who wanted to use me for health coaching and somebody that I used to work with who knew me and she was needed a health coach. And so that was like a good kind of first win. 
Um, and then I had another company that I had worked with previously that reached out to me and said, we would really love to work with you. And so I ended up with these two corporate wellness accounts. And so naturally kind of kept investing my energy there and, and let the other two things drop. So, yeah, so that's my evolution. That's my 90 days, my 90 days in where I was at and where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah. And we'll get at the end. We'll make sure we talk about where you are now, because yeah, I think that's, it's, it's so funny. I have so much advice at the end, you know, we're, we're going to talk about like advice for people, because I think we just gave us all, you're not going to have it all figured out and it's okay. Yeah. You need to try to figure some stuff out, but a lot of it is getting out there and testing and experimenting with things, getting some feedback mm-hmm. and then ultimately going, who's going to pay for this? Like who is actually going to pay me money for, for, for doing mm-hmm. something? I think that was my biggest shock like because when I was at Blue Cross there was the the brand that I had around me and the access to employers like of course they knew us as their insurance carrier and so I, I had this access to a ton of people and all of a sudden when you're on your own you're just one more person trying to get in to see them to sell them something on wellness that they really don't care about to be honest mm-hmm. I really thought that everyone really needed a, a, a wellness strategy And then it took me a while ago. People don't care about a wellness strategy. That's like the last thing they care about. They care about Mm -hmm. you, the health coaching. They care about that or they care about you running programs, all of that. But they they don't care about that. And that that was quite the the interesting situation for me was going, okay, this was what I was thinking I was going to sell. And then you get out and you're going, yeah, people don't care. And they're not going to really pay you money for that. All right, Mm -hmm. on to plan B. Mm -hmm. so I think it it is I see so many people thinking that that they know what they're going to do when they get out or they have this big plan and I I don't know I guess I'm one of those people that when they were asking me to do a business strategy or business plan I was like I don't know like I probably should have had more of an idea but outside (laughs) of doing a wellness strategy for people that I love doing and now I'm like Mm -hmm. now I'm even like is it even that important like it should just be tied into the overall business strategy so it's funny how how different I think now three years later than I did getting out thinking everyone needed a wellness strategy. Yeah, that's how, I mean, my corporate wellness stuff too was like, was the wellness strategy. Like I was going to sell the whole, like what I did for other people, was build it, right? And they were like, okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, was, it didn't land, the, the building the whole strategy piece. It needed to be much more tangible. I think when you're an external person, it has to be much more like, here's the thing I do. Mm -hmm. And not like, because they say, you know, I often was like, well, but what is it that you're going to do? And I'd be like, well, I have to come in and I have to figure out your problems. And I have to, we have to figure it all out. Like, I don't, we don't know what we're going to do yet. And I think they were just, people would often just kind of stare blankly back at me in those earlier days. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. You, you do need to be very like telling them exactly what, and it is harder when you're like you and I you're going, I don't know. Like I need to, <laughs> I really do need to go in and figure it out, but having a framework or process or steps and it, it clearly spelled out makes people a lot more comfortable. And I think the other mm-hmm. thing I hear people like, I'm just going to do consulting. Well, there's not, I mean, I don't do consulting that much. Like occasionally mm-hmm. we'll get consulting. I don't see a ton of that and I don't see a ton of, even people I know that are like getting be- that their that clients are beating down their door asking for wellness consulting, and I think that's where a lot of people go. Well, I'll just do wellness consulting, and I'm like, eh, it could. Maybe you'll get lucky. And I don't know about you, Maggie. Do you do a lot of wellness consulting? Is that something that I know you've done? You've done some, and you do some, but yeah. I mean, I just recently got asked to do consulting, like in a in a pretty traditional consulting role. And I think it's an organization that they are consultants themselves and they're used to a consulting model and kind of spending some time like in the weeds of thinking about things. And I think a lot of other organizations I found, you know, you're working with somebody in HR or a benefit specialist who's really looking for some lunch and learns or Mm -hmm. a training or a health coach. And so the whole big consulting piece is, is much 
is an entirely different thing to sell. So I agree. I think, I think that the corporate wellness consulting maybe will grow, but I agree with you. I have not seen much of a market for that. Well, plus, I think there are those clients out there, and I think that they're unique. They're unicorns. Right, right. There's a there's a co- company I've been in contact with that is getting together like a consulting that that I would bid for, and they asked me if I wanted to bid for like, but it's, it's few and far between. And I think too, employers look to other people to consult. They look to their insurance carrier, they look to their insurance broker, they look to anyone pretty much that they already have in house and staff, and and an, mm-hmm. as an existing resource to do that. So. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm glad you shared yeah, that. Definitely. I didn't know. Maybe you were like raking in the consulting clients and I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I am not. I well, definitely am not. Well, I find it, it's, it's kind of how, I know you work very closely with modern office methods and I work very closely with the client here in, in Raleigh and they want you to actually do it. They, they want the yes. strategy, yes. but then you they want you to do it, which is like what I'm doing for them, right? I am the wellness person. Right for their organization. And so we're consulting and then we're doing. And yes, correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's exactly what I would say is like, I, I would not count my client modern office methods as a consulting job because I'm, I'm doing the consulting, but I'm also the deliverer. Mm -hmm. I'm like in there doing the trainings, doing lunch and learns, coming up with the yearly plan, executing it, measuring it and year over year. So. Which has some strengths in a sense. And so one, there's pieces I love about this, pieces I don't love, I'm going to be quite honest. But what I do love about it is that I still stay in the trenches. So when I'm training wellness professionals, I'm like, I gotcha. I know it's, mm-hmm. it's hard because I think sometimes when quote unquote thought leaders who aren't being consulted, who, the, who aren't actually doing anymore or people who are just speaking on stage and not doing, you're like, that's a great piece of advice, but hey, that's, there's like eight roadblocks in my way. How do I get through it? And so that is mm-hmm. what I do love about the work that I do with the client here. Definitely. I asked Wakoa for some feedback from my keynote. Mm-hmm. And one of the things of feedback that came back were Jen and Maggie were very relevant. I, I'm going to botch the exact comment, but basically were really relevant. And it would be nice if all of the speakers could have spoken in that amount of relevancy towards this work. And I just, so to your point, I mean, I don't think that, I don't think you're off on that statement. I do think that that gives, it gives us some street cred (laughs) that we're still working with organizations and that we were boots on the ground. And I think, I think that that has its, its value in some of the other work that we do where we're trying to lead other practitioners. Mm -hmm. So I want to fill in the gaps here. So I think, you know, in, in, in the effort to be really transparent, so people listening to this are probably have maybe thought about like, maybe should I go on my own? Where does our money come from? So if we're going, we don't do consulting, but we do this. I think it's, it's going to be like, well, how the hell are you living, right? Because like, I, I think one other thing is that it is, I have to make money. Like if I don't make money, my kids don't eat because right. My husband's Mm -hmm. also an entrepreneur and he has been on his own for a while. So it's not like I have someone, this is the sound, this sounds bad. This is, I haven't pre, I haven't thought about this ahead of time, so I'm just going to say it. So, like, I don't have like health insurance benefits through someone else. Like, I don't have this extra stack of income going through someone else. So, I think. I have to make money. So I think it's important to talk about because I have heard someone say to me recently, well, I'm going on my own, but my husband has a great job, so I don't need to worry about it, which is an awesome like, place uh. to be. <laughs> like, hey, if, that, if I could have been in that spot, like my husband left his job before I left mine, so he did it first. That is a great place to be. So no judgment on that person. I'm just not that way. Sure. So that, I think that's why it's important for you guys to go, hey, guys. We do own businesses and we have to make money. So I'll put mine out there. And mine was the, the main client that just talked to you that I work with. That is a big piece. I also do resilience trainings to make up money, income, and then speaking engagements. And then uh, some of the training I'm doing for wellness professionals. So Redesigning Wellness Academy that's coming up and Next Gen Wellness Training. Those are my two trainings. So that is that's a lot of trainings is, is what I'm trainings and speaking is kind of my other portion of money and in money income, however you want to say that, mm-hmm. in, in addition to the client I have. So I just, I wanted to fill in that hole because I think it's important when we're talking about this. 
Yeah, my income has been, I have two primary clients. So I have one employee who manages one client and I manage the other. So we have that. And then for me, I earn money through a little bit of writing. So I do some writing for Wellcoa and other similar publications, and I earn a little bit that way. And I'm trying to think. And then, you know, like I do still, as a, I'm like you, like I need, there's a certain amount of profit that I need to earn every month. And when I don't, I'm definitely sweating it. So I had the opportunity to pitch for like a really big opportunity with a client recently and then they decided to go in a different direction but then they were like hey do you want to do some lunch and learns and they were like food demo kind of lunch and learns which I haven't done in a really long time but given the amount that I had invested in trying to get this client I thought those are things that in the past I've passed on like no I don't do those any I don't do that work anymore because it takes me in a totally different direction and causes me to lose a little focus but this time I was like yep this is what it's going to cost. And if you do three of them, I'll give you a little bit of a discount. And because I thought like that's some, that was cash flow that I was anticipating given the amount that I had invested in getting that client. And then it fell through. And so then they were like, Hey, can you, do you want to do this? Which I was really grateful for. So it's like a small way that I could, and that was really meaningful. So I definitely have some other little like side things. More and more, I'm earning money through trainings. So I do a like a, a benchmark number one, committed and aligned leadership. I will come in and train your leaders on what a well-being strategy looks like and the science behind that. So that here's the VOI. It's like here's the science and here is the science so that you understand when these people come knocking on your door and they want to do these things, why they want to do it in the way they want to do it. And then I do training, which is we talked about in the last podcast around creating thriving cultures and everybody having a collective responsibility to culture and how we build influence in the organization so that well-being is a part of the way that we do business, essentially. So I'm my business is shifting more to those things and then also speaking. So I think in this next year, I'll shift more of my income towards trainings and speaking. Yeah, that's just, I mean, I think that's, first of all, I didn't know you had some writing gigs. So that's pretty awesome. But it is interesting how things shift, right? It, what, what makes up your income mm-hmm. one year may look completely different the other year. And I want to also be clear that I barely made any money my first year in business. Like I was perfectly, mm-hmm. <laughs> if it wasn't for that, that damn income that needed to be made, I was perfectly happy just writing on blogs and doing my podcast <laughs> and having a lot of free time to think about things. And then uh, thankfully it all changed because that meant I, I was making some more money and, and getting busier, but yeah, it, it's all this, this big evolution. But I do think it's very important for people to think about what would people pay for because I don't think mm-hmm. I did enough of that, which leads to my leads me to my next question is, what would you have done differently? Or is there anything? I always say, like, can't I don't like I never regret things, right? They all happen the way they happen. But if you could go back in time and say, okay, I would have done this differently, what would that be? I can't. There's nothing I can directly point to that I would be like, God, I wish I would have done different that differently because I think that like, you know, part of the reason it took me so long to really narrow my work down to a training is because I had my own cynicism about trainings, like that they, it's it's like we come in and we do a training and then we're out. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, so I didn't, like I held myself back for a long time from, from doing that kind of work until like I worked through some, my own perspective on things. And so I can see how so much of the things that I wish I would have gotten here faster or I wish I would have not done that were all a part of me evolving and and being a student of my experiences, which I think makes me a better business owner. And so I wish so many times that I was further along than I am, but I also know that it has been an evolution both of self and of business. And I think, you know, all of those things have been really important for my own personal growth. 
And I know that like nobody wants to hear that answer. Like it's all a part of the process. It's all a part <laughs> of the, the reality. Yeah. Is. <laughs> like everybody's like, no, Maggie, just tell me literally where you fell in the pit, and like so I don't do that. But I once had an intern who said to me, she was a dietetic intern, and she said, when you think about your career, what advice would you give me to make sure that I just can like move through my own career more easily? Mm-hmm. And I was like, you you truly have to show up exactly as you are where you are every time and, and like be in your, be willing to be in your own messiness because that's just a part of the process. So, that, well, you know, it's funny, like move through your career more easily. Like it's, it's not easy. Like nothing's easy. Like, <laughs> and you don't grow, like I've grown a hell of a lot more from the things that have like really knocked me down in my career mm-hmm. than anything that I've achieved. So that's just so funny. I mean, it's, funny not not hot. you know what I mean like <laughs> right I'm not making fun right. of that but, and I think we like, all yeah, like easy we all have that desire to be like what are all the pitfalls and how do I avoid them and I think that's mm-hmm. I think it's a smart thing to ask I just would say that like my own pitfalls were things I needed to fall in so that I could figure out why I fell in it so that I could get out and I don't know if I would have listened to anyone's advice at yeah. all so even when we give advice I don't know if people are really gonna listen to that advice but, you know, I think I would have, you know, one of the things that if I look back as I was kind of thinking about this podcast and, and hoping I could help a few people just think about it. At the time when I was working, I was very happy with my job. I actually loved my job. And I guess I didn't talk about this at the beginning. What really got me looking elsewhere was because I wasn't, I wasn't, I was excelling at everything. And I, I'm not saying this in a braggy mm-hmm. way. I'm saying this because I had an awesome team. And we were knocking it out of the park. And every time we'd reach a goal, they'd move the goal on me. And they're going, oh, no, I didn't mean that. I meant this. And then I couldn't get promoted. I couldn't, like, and it was just, I was so frustrated. So I sadly left my job. I wasn't, like, I wasn't frustrated, at, like, with my actual job. But I was in a situation where I was in the industry where I wanted to work, right? So I couldn't, I felt like anything I couldn't get my business started as I was working in the job because that just felt like it, that wasn't an honest thing to do. So I just kind of left that, left that alone and said, okay, when I start, I start and I start separately from my employment. But I probably, as I was thinking about this, one thing that would have been cool is if I could have gone to work for a company that did some learning and development or organizational development, even in a part-time manner or as at a contract to learn from another profession or area of, of learning and, you know, or even worked and did some training for somebody just to have mm-hmm. a little bit of income and get exposed to a lot more learning to see what I could learn. I wasn't in that place to do that, but I think having that step of income, I, I think that is a piece of advice I'd give people to do something that's okay if it's not exactly in your profession. And mm-hmm. the other thing, the yeah. other thing I would have done differently is done, done a little market research. I didn't do enough because again, I was in this w- weird predicament with my employer that I never wanted to kind of do anything that wasn't honest. So I couldn't ask a lot of people how they, what they thought of this because it felt like it was, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I felt like it was, uh, words aren't coming to me. It's the afternoon when we're doing this. And not as good in the afternoon. Yeah, no, I feel honest. I recently, I was going to say, I, I hear what you're saying. I think what you're saying is, you know, I, was, I recently heard a woman say, you know, I went to start this business. And so I read a book on like writing a business plan. And I thought, oh, I should have done that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, oh, that was really good. That was really good. So like I, what I hear you saying is like done more prep work to be more realistic about it. Is that what you mean? I would have done more. Mar- I would have said, okay, what does the market really want? So let me actually look at what's out there outside of the insurance carrier. Because when you're in an insurance carrier, mm-hmm. just so it's just such a different spot. Like I said, you come with the brand. I didn't know what individuals in the, what, in the wellness can't say consulting. That's the easiest thing to say. Where we are now, I didn't know what they were doing or even how they made their money. Because I don't think people are always transparent about that. Mm-hmm. But I think it should be more realistic about what they offer and so what people would actually buy. So again, I thought yeah. everyone would buy these wellness strategies. Nobody cares. Like I had to mm-hmm. <laughs> get out there and, and try to sell that. But I think that's maybe what I would have done differently. But again, like I did it all the way and I don't know if I would have listened to anyone else giving me advice. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've talked about some of the, let's talk about what we love. 
Like, what do you love about being on your own? Because there is such a great, wonderful part of being on your own that I don't want to get buried in the challenges, which we'll talk about next. Mm -hmm. But what do you love about it? Yeah, I love that I have complete autonomy over my work life. Like when I am sick, I mean, if unless I'm at a client site, like I don't have to call in sick. I don't have to justify self-care. I don't have to justify, like I don't have to worry if anybody else thought my choices I made for my own life were worth it, right? Or mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about letting somebody else down who has to cover my shift or, you know, which really hasn't been a part of, because I'm more project work when I'm not at work, even when I had an employer, wasn't really a big thing. But I do think that all the time. And like with three, with a young family, I mean, I had in my second year in business, I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And me too. I, like so, I, <laughs> yeah. So, like having a baby, like maternity leave, like there was no, yeah. I mean, just the autonomy, my ability to make the choices that are right for me and my family without having to answer to anybody. And I just, I know that that's not a thing that people, most Americans, have. So I routinely feel grateful for that. And then also, like I love building strategies. I love problem solving. And so one of my favorite times of the year is this time right now. It's October. I'm starting to really reflect back on the previous year, think about where I want to go in the future, how I want to shape all of that. And then what exactly am I going to do? Like, What's my operating plan to achieve those goals? And putting all of that together, you know, is then is one of my favorite things. And even though I had kind of this wonky list of services or the way I was going to do business early on, I do have my business plan that maybe isn't how you would do it if you read a book about running a business plan. That's (laughs) how I did it. (laughs) And I look back and I can chuckle at some things, like the things I thought would make money or how quickly I'd grow or, but I can look at like that mission and vision statement and I, I, every time I, I forget about it and then I go back and I read it and I think, oh my gosh, I'm still doing that. And so there's this core of myself that I get to bring to life through my own work. And that is, for me, really grounding and purposeful and meaningful. That's very um, admirable. I mean, I think that's one of the hardest things, which I'm not going to get into quite yet. <laughs> but it's easy. It's easy yeah. to forget that, right? Like it's easy to forget why we do what we do, why we left our job, the impact we want to make on the world. So I think that's it's great that you're yeah. that you're drawing that out. I uh, I love creating new things. It's always it was probably the bane of my team's existence when I did work at Blue Cross because like Jen seriously like stop like stop making things, and I'm gonna really watch myself. But um, I think being on your own too, I can pivot how I want to pivot. Like I don't have yes to worry about. Like I am creating the strategy, and then if I don't like the strategy, I can pivot to another one. But that flexibility is is it's really fun for me. And also the thing, I've said this on the the podcast before, is that being on my own has challenged me in ways I've never been challenged before. And you have to do a lot of self-reflecting when you're going, okay, I have to do all of these things. I don't know how they're all going to get done. I've got to balance, you know, the kids and all all caregiving and all that stuff with, with it. I've got to make a certain amount of money. And I've got to overcome some fears about selling. And I've got to go do all of these things that sometimes are a little scary. So I think that is, and I'm a big, like growth is one of my um, needs and values. And so it has just filled me up in growth, that's for sure. And I feel like um, just being exposed to so many different people on the podcast has made me grow as well. So that is, it's just one of the best things that I just wasn't getting in corporate America. I was driving mm-hmm. my own growth, which is fine too. I mean, kind of driving it here, but it's just happenstance. You have no choice but to grow as a business owner. Yeah. It's funny. I, shortly after I started my own business, it's like six months in and I had gotten this health coaching contract and full disclosure, my health coaching contract was with like a previous employer. Like, so I had this job and then I left there and went and worked somewhere else. And it was after I worked that place that then I started on my own. So it was like two jobs ago. 
and they needed a health coach and I was a known entity for them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was good for them. But also because I had left there, I needed to sit down with the director of HR who used to be the person I reported to. Right. And so we kind of had to have this like coming back together and like telling our stories as they happen for us or whatever. But anyway, she said, you know, gosh, I really appreciate you coming forward and being willing to have this conversation with me. And now that we're here, they were at the time looking for a director of wellness. And she said, would you like to talk about that position? And I just said, no. And I said, because I think that when I want to be able to change and move and grow, when I see an opportunity, I want to be able to go after it. And like, I want that to happen in six months. And I, in full respect to this huge corporation that you're with, this huge organization that you're with, like it could take you, like you probably see the same opportunity and you are going to like steadily go after it. And it might take you six years. Mm -hmm. And there was this really deep appreciation that she had, I think for me being willing to know that about myself and even to say like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like there's a, there's a steadiness that's needed in these larger organizations Mm -hmm. of people who are willing to pace themselves for that long-term change. And that it's such an important recognition as an entrepreneur. And for those of who might be listening who are familiar with the predictive index, my archetype on there, and I bet yours is probably similar, is a maverick. And the little like description under maverick, it says like undaunted by failure, <laughs> like, <laughs> like needs was like pretty routine change. And so I think that that the willingness to pivot is a huge factor for me as well. Yeah, I haven't taken that one. I think I had the opportunity last year and I just didn't do it, which I probably should have heard great things about it. So I can help you. I can help you take it. I'm curious now. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that I don't know if that would be me. That's interesting. People are on to Enneagram now and, and like people have guessed my numbers and I'm like, I don't know. I just need to, to try what it to actually take it to see what I am. Yeah. But okay, so let's think about challenges. What have been the biggest challenges? Of being on your own? Uh, myself. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. <laughs> I, well, first of all, I, I love working in teams and, you know, I've had one employee for a long time. Right now I just brought on somebody else like super part-time. And so I'm having team meetings, which has been really nice. Like for the first time in four years, I have this team of people where we're like talking about growing the business and how we're going to do that. And that's been really lovely. But being alone has been one of my biggest challenges. And I think just back to the going back to my own mission and vision statement from time to time is helpful because most of the time there's this feeling like you're you're constantly surveying the landscape. Where is the market going? What will people people pay for? Okay, I've been given five no's for that thing. So now where am I going? Or like the industry is shaping itself this way. And how do I stay relevant in that? And so there's, you're kind of like constantly like a, trying to be a chameleon. And so sometimes you forget what color you are, right? You forget like that base point for yourself. And so I think there's been lots of days where I feel kind of this like internal anxious vibration of like needing some grounding, which is probably where the team comes in for me. Money has been hard. Like I had a business loan and that got me solidly through my first like year and three months. And then it was really sink or swim and making choices where to spend money and where not to spend money and being willing to talk about money openly mm-hmm. has been a challenge. So I think just by and large, it's that you, you really are on your own. There's nowhere to like fall back and land for a minute. It's like every day you're doing new things. So now that I'm doing more speaking, you know, writing the right bio or the right speaker proposal or, and then somebody gives you feedback. Somebody recently was just like, oh, no, don't say that. (laughs) And, you know, like I said to my husband later, sometimes I just want to be like, hey, 
I really appreciate your feedback, but could you just like calm it down a little bit? Because all day I'm doing things that I've never done before, yes. like all the time. That's when you just say, thank you for the feedback, not in smile and just say, <laughs> well, it was really valuable feedback. It truly was. And I, it was, and I knew that that was more a representation of just my own exhaustion mm-hmm. than it was that he, this person was not being unkind at all. I've done that before that. Thank you for your feedback. That's not helpful. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it wasn't, it was just that sense that was like the realization for me. And I'm sure you feel the same way where you, like, you, you're doing new things that you've never done before all the time. Yeah. So you don't reach that point of excellence or where you're like, okay, I've got that. That feels really solid to me. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes you're not in a place to hear it, right? Like, it, like if I'm overwhelmed with a lot of other stuff, I'm like, I just can't right now. Like, I just <laughs> can't take in the information. You may mean well, but I just can't do it. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else? I mean, that's, that's enough challenges. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Those are, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. When you said myself, I'm like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, uh, I stand in my way a lot of times. Uh, and I do want to say money too. I think I was talking to someone one-on-one and I'm pretty much the same on this podcast as I am one-on-one is on a stage. It may be a fault of mine, but that's just how I am. And I was like, you know, when I used to work in a corporate job and I made good money and I used to shop all the time, like I always wear nice clothes and I always like, cause I was going into a professional office or with clients. And so I always bought new clothes. Now I'm like, eh, that money, I don't have like all this extra money to go shopping right now. (laughs) So I'm like, that's some things that you have to consider. I mean, you're, you know, some people leaving their jobs may be fine with money. They may, I talked to one person before I left my job. Um, I was just kind of surveying people. And this one lady is like, yeah, I made 60,000 the first year I left my job. And I was like, oh, good for you. I hate you. Um, but you know, <laughs> I don't think that's normal in my conversations not, with people. I so, it's not normal. <laughs> but you know, what's so funny is I'm so willing to sacrifice not, you know, I have, don't worry people. Like if I'm going to show up on stage or if I'm going to show up at a client's office, I wear nice clothes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not <laughs> coming out looking like a bum. Um, but I don't go like, go, I feel like shopping. And I, you know, so it's like, I make sacrifices because to me, it's more worth it to be on my own and have the freedom and independence that I have than to be yeah. in, in a job that I don't feel like I'm growing at just to buy new clothes. So I think it's not always going to be this way, you know, one day it'll continue to grow. But when you're in the early stages of your business, which I don't think a lot of people talk about it, right? They talk about it when they've already like turned the corner and they're making a buttload of money. And then they're like, I remember when it was so hard. <laughs> just like, right. no, you know, years three and four can be hard too. And just your expectations yeah. have to be kept in check. And I think for me, besides those two things that are definitely a challenge, it's, it's working on the business versus in the business. And I hear this a lot with, with people like us. So for, for listeners, it's, you know, you can either look at the worker bee level or the CEO level. And there are two different levels. And a lot of times I get stuck in the worker bee level and I forget about the bigger picture. And I think, you know, like kind mm-hmm. of bigger, bigger strategy. And so, cause I'm like, well, this, this shit needs to be get done. Right. Like, it's nice to think about these long-term things, but right now I need to execute on all the things that I have in, in the pipeline and all, all of that. And then I, I'm still not going to give myself downtime. I just feel like there's so much to do and it's all fun stuff. Like I love working on my business. So it's like, I really get into it and I could keep working. I'm not like a, a workaholic or anything. I'm not one of those people, you know, that, that works across, like around the clock because seriously at, at night I'm done and I don't work late hours. But those are... And then also, I think you alluded to this too, so that very precious time you have and what's going to actually drive your business forward. Mm -hmm. I could probably spend the whole podcast on challenges, but I I won't do that. (laughs) As you're talking, I had like three more that came up and I was like, I think, I think they get the point. (laughs) Well, I know. I I mean, it is, I like to try to tell as balanced a story as possible because I would never take it back. And I would, I'm like, if I regretted it, I'd go get a job. Like, so it's not like I regret it. All these challenges are completely worth it. But I had a definitely like a rosy picture of what it's going to be like to work on my own. Like I, I remember thinking, well, I'll just take long walks and I'll have all this time. I don't know what the hell I was thinking because it's, 
Yeah. I'm like, can I get a quick loop in with the dog real quick? It's just, you're doing stuff, but again, totally worth it. Mm -hmm. And but even though people may not listen to our advice, I think we need to give some because I got a ton of it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. yeah, they can take it with a grain of salt if they're even listening at this point. I love telling people what to do. <laughs> All right. So what are your top pieces of advice for those who want to go on their own? So they're, they're still in a job, but they've kind of got the dreamy notions that I'm going to go out on my own. What is your, what's your advice for them? Really your capacity to do it. So there were lots of times that I needed to kind of melt down and needed to look at my husband and be like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And I needed to have somebody. So there's like this capacity of yourself to be able to have moments where you can really break down and get back up. Right. And just like when we coach people like on well being in general, we say it's not always a time we don't ask a swimmer to improve their time if they're swimming upstream. So if you're swimming upstream in your life, maybe it's not the right time to consider starting a business. And even for me, like I, for me, it wasn't the right time. I was really pretty broken by the time I started my own business, but I also went and got a loan. And so I was able to take three months to recover, to regain capacity before I could get back up. And really come at this thing hard. So like have capacity, not just your own personal capacity, but capacity in the family around you to be able to walk in step through those challenges. And I and be really realistic with yourself about that because those are important, important factors, I think, in, in the success of not just the business, but your own self through this. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That can't be it. I got a whole list of things. You may go with one and then I'll give you some time to think about it. Yeah, that. go for it. Go for it. Oh, okay. One of the things, this is so funny because I was hiking with my sister-in-law when we were, I went to go see my brother. We were in Washington state and we were hiking and she's kind of wanted to go on her own for a while. And it was frustrating me, but I identify it. I identified with it very well because Oftentimes when people get excited about starting their business, they spend time and money on things like your logo and your website. And so she was going to go do all of these things like meet with a website designer and all this and sink money into things. And I was like, does anyone want to buy your stuff? Like she, she's a, a wonderful um, culinary chef. She's a chef and she's a um, pastry. I don't know what you call them. I don't want to say a baker because that's not right. She's been to Johnson and Wales. She's fantastic. And I would just say she's a baker, mm -hmm. but I'm like, go to the farmer's market and sell some desserts. And if people buy them, then at least, you know, you got something because what happens mm -hmm. and what I've seen people do and what I was always tempted to do is poor investment of time and resources and money into things like your website. Like it's going to shift. It's going to change. You need one, but no one hires you really for your website. It's, it's you and what you're going to put out there. And I still sometimes go, God, I should really redo my logo. Oh, who cares? <laughs> I go forward on things. But it, it, it's what we all get caught up in. I did. I was like, my website needs to be perfect. And so I think that is one piece that like people fantasize about, but it doesn't matter if no one wants your thing, right? <laughs> what, you're, mm -hmm. what you're selling. I think too, you've alluded to this before, like be very specific with your offerings, even if they're all disjointed and you're going, I don't know if any of this is going to sell. You have to be very specific so people know what you're selling. And then I think you, what you just said is like, is it the right time? It's not the right time for everyone. I think there's a lot of advantages for staying in corporate America, like your benefits like 401k and PTO. And there's a lot of ways to make your job more interesting. So like if you're just burnt out on your job, that may or may not be the right time, but it, sometimes it's not the right time. Like for you, Maggie, and it all works out. So take that right. one with a grain of salt. And then I think I've got two more. <laughs> I like, apparently I like to give advice to build a financial cushion, like expect not to make money right away. And so as much as you can save and as much as you can cut back on stuff now, like I was listening to a, a podcast of someone completely outside of our, our world of work, say wellness. And he's like, before we went, I went out on my own, him and his wife, like paid off debt. Like they just took a year, paid off all the debt that they needed to pay off before he went out on his own. And so it's like doing those things as you are preparing. 
So I guess it's just preparing and then never burning bridges with your company. I mean, like the, the main client I have now is I did work with them when I was at Blue Cross and they came to me after I left Blue Cross. Same with you, right? They trusted you Mm -hmm. to do coaching for their company. So your companies that you're with now don't burn the bridge. It's not worth it. In my opinion, Mm -hmm. that may be. Yeah. (laughs) It's hard for me. I think the reason for me, it's like just all about, like, because I didn't, I didn't think a lot about starting a business before I did. Mm -hmm. So I don't have this like sense of like, what would I, you know, I was just like, I took a deep breath and then I did it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I think a lot of what you said too, is like, can you try, are you the right type of person that will figure it out? Mm -hmm. Like if you are given a blank state and you're just going, Oh, and this is, I have to mark this as explicit. So excuse me, friends. I feel like me, you and I are just talking, Maggie, and it gets dangerous when I get in these conversations, but it's like, you're, you're sitting there and you're going, oh shit, I need to make some money. Do you have the confidence yeah. in yourself to say, I'm going to figure it out and make some money? Yes. Yeah. And I think too, like I, you know, when I started a business and I, there were parts of it I was really enjoying and every, like, it was like everybody that came to me that was like, oh, I don't like my job. I was like, you should go out on your own. Right. Like, and me too. It was like this, <laughs> I, I just would tell everybody this. And finally, somebody was like, I you know I appreciate that, that you think I'm, I can do that. But that is not who I am. It's not a thing I can do. And since then, I, I've had the opportunity to learn more about like the predictive index. And, you know, there are people that have a different have a different pace. They have a different comfort level with different things. And and it is not for everyone. It really, truly isn't. So I think that's a little bit of self-discovery would be a good first step. And like maybe work with a therapist or a spiritual director or have somebody help you take a PI, do some strengths-based testing. What is it about you that's going to help kind of carry you through a little personal evaluation before you really go out on your own? Yeah. And even thinking about what you don't like about your job, like, what is it? Because I find that there are things, there's like, there's things I loved about, like I said, I loved my job, but there's, even if you don't like your job, there's relationships you can make. There's, there's ways to kind of make it what you want it sometimes. Like a wellness professional that I know and was in a training, like she didn't really love her job. And it was like, she kept trying to, you know, push the status quo and keep getting pretty much pushed back. And then she ended up connecting with, like by having some really good conversations, connecting with a women's group and you know, really being able to pursue her interest in mental health and mental well-being. And so that made it better. I mean, it didn't make it perfect, but it made it better. And she got mm-hmm. to pursue what she really enjoyed there. And it's so funny when you said, like, I told everyone they should go work for themselves. I did the same thing. I was so high on myself for the first six months. And I don't know why I wasn't making any money, but I was thinking oh, everyone should leave their jobs. <laughs> Well, probably it was you just had like, well, and probably yet when, when you are out on your own, you have like probably inappropriate levels of hope and, <laughs> and optimism <laughs> because you have to, like, you just have to, right? Like you have to go like, okay. So like every year I write goals of like, this is what I hope to make this year. And this is how I hope to make it. And that's how I develop my operating plan and all the things, but like, the number of years that I've been off on that. Right. And I've made momentum. I've made progress in all those directions, but it's never like what I thought it was going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm getting, first of all, one, I'm getting better at setting more appropriate goals, but I do think too, it's like in that first year, probably even two years, you are, you're kind of high on this experience of like doing the thing and with this faith that just like, it's going to work it's going to work. And I'll say, they say like 90% of businesses fail within the first three years. And most businesses, like if you can hit that three-year mark, like you should start to see this kind of like tipping point, you know, where you like things come a little bit easier. My third year was so, lacked so much momentum, lacked so much anything. It was really kind of a dark year for me where I was just like, gosh, I have been faithfully, like optimistically, strategically planting these seeds for growth. Mm -hmm. And there's just like a drought. And so it was a really low year, my third year in business, when I was supposed to start seeing some of the work pay off. And so I think that's just like, we are, you are a little bit high on the whole experience. And 
I don't know if it's full of ourselves or just uh, in a disproportionate levels of hope. <laughs> and well, optimism. I do love that. I mean, I think we have to stay hopeful and optimistic. We just have, I mean, you have to, cause there, I think there is just, there's a great potential. You just have to go through a lot of growing pains and stick with it and, and pivot and evolve. And as our industry keeps evolving, we have to too. And yeah, it is. I hope we haven't talked to people out of going out on their own because it really is a great thing. It's just, I think we need to be real behind, like, and not wait till we're all like, <laughs> you know, at, at our level of perfection or what we're hoping for. Like we're in between. So I think, I think people mm-hmm. don't talk about the hard stuff enough. So like I said, I hope we didn't talk people out of going out on their own, but it just really gave them a clear picture into it's not always easy. Well, and you said, if you could go, Like if you wanted to, you could go get a job right now. And I would say I'm in the same boat and neither of us are. And so being realistic about the challenges for people, I think if you're listening to this and you've been thinking about going on your own and you're sweating all of a sudden, I think keep in mind, like you and I would not go get a job right now. Like with, with all of those challenges that we face, we'd rather face these challenges than the ones that we would be facing with an employer. Absolutely. So. Well, I think that's a good note, an optimistic note to end on before I say anything that would stress anyone else out. (laughs) So Mackie, where can people find out more about you and the work you do? Well, my website that doesn't have anything about athletic training or athletic nutritional counseling or anything that I used (laughs) to do, it's totally revamped now is realizewellbeing.com. And then I just use my regular personal social media to connect with people there. So this is like Maggie Goff, G-O-U-G-H. So that's where people can find me. And I was really struggling with your name before we met, but then you said rhymes with cough and I got it. Maggie Goff. Yes. <laughs> yes. Maggie, thank you so much. I'll link that up in the show notes, but honestly, thank you for a truly transparent conversation around being on your own in this lovely industry we're in. Definitely. Thank you, Jen. One of the things I frequently hear from wellness professionals is that they want a tribe. They want to find their people. In other words, a place where they can express their opinion without getting chastised for it and where they can get support when they're butting up against the old wellness paradigm. If you're looking for that safe space, come and join us in the Redesigning Wellness community on Facebook. To find us, you can just go to Facebook and in the search bar, type Redesigning Wellness Community and it'll pop right up. You'll just have to answer a couple questions and I'll let you right in. I'd love to see you there.